Um, Barb is the Michigan DNR waterfowl and wetland specialist position she's held now for nine years. Previously, she worked as the, as the MDNR wildlife biologist in the Saginaw Bay region, overseeing several large managed wetland areas. She has a BS in zoology from Michigan State University and a master's degree in wildlife ecology from Mississippi State University. And she's currently pursuing her PhD degree in human dimensions of wildlife management in Michigan State University. And this summer, I will say, she came over to Crystal Lake went out with uh, Kurt, Randy, and their crew, and there she was putting on the boots and getting that, out that photo. I was there. Robert, thank you. Thank you. Species and ban a lot of waterfowl species, so I got to add a new species to my list, so <laughs> I would be pretty happy. Um, so I just have a really short presentation this morning or this afternoon. Um, I want to talk about our control policy and the program that we're developing. Um, but I kind of look at this as like a, a public service announcement too. We do have this draft policy that will be coming out soon. And I wanted to make sure everybody knows that that's going to be out for public comment. And to also just give you guys the instructions on how to provide some comment and some input if you choose to. And then of course just to let you guys ask any questions that I might be able to help answer. Um, so just really briefly, you know, what I plan on talking about this afternoon is, you know, what was the need for this type of policy. We've heard a lot of great information already. Um, and then the kind of process that we used um, to develop this policy as well. Just a little bit of a sneak peek of the policy, kind of showing you some of the outline and what you can expect to see in it. And we can talk about some of those uh, particular pieces as well. Let you know what that timeline looks like, and then, like I said, the most important thing, at least to me, is let you know how to provide comments. Um, so this first one here, you know, what was the need for a, a long-term common merganser policy? Um, I mean, as you know, and you've heard all day long today that there's been this desire to continue to do and increase, you know, perhaps the amount of common merganser control, particularly trapping and relocating. Um, Kind of what, what DNR, especially Wildlife Division, what our role is in this is not, you know, our role isn't to solve swimmer's itch, but our role is the piece that involves common mergansers and other wildlife species. So that's kind of where we fit into this. You know, our, our mission is the protection and the scientific management of wildlife species. That's a, that's, um, a role that we share with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. So there's, because these are migratory species, they're migratory birds, that that role of protection but also permitting of any activities that affect these species is one that's shared between the federal um, agency, in this case Fish and Wildlife Service, and the state agency or the DNR. So that's kind of where we come into play on all of this. Um, so it's true, I've been working with you know um, this group and you know Higgins Lake before that and um, for quite some time now trying to figure out trying to help you guys out, give you the kind of tools that you need and that you're asking for as they pertain to common um, answers. Um, and like it has already been mentioned that in the past, the, a lot of this work with common answers, with trapping them and relocating them was all done under scientific collector's permit. So it was all done as research. And it, it appears that we, we've turned that page already, that we're no longer talking a lot about research activities but now we're looking at more of you know, our control program. This is something more lakes are interested in. There's other contractors that want to get involved into this work, and so it really has kind of moved into that realm of more control than it is research. So that kind of pushes it into a whole new category for us as far as programming and policies and the types of permits that we issue to do these things. So, um, you know, this is kind of probably more of a boring part, but it's like, how can we make this happen for you guys? And there's a lot of, of that administrative type work that needs to happen. So the process that we've used for the policy development um, was really important, especially to me that we used a really um, stakeholder engagement process. So we wanted to work with, with the stakeholders, in this case, you know, with the different lakes, hear from you, you know, we've tried an awful lot of things through the years, you guys are the experts when it comes to this, so we really wanted to get your thoughts on that. 
What we ended up doing was forming this five lake core team, which is all the lakes that you've heard, you know, reporting um, on today. And we brought the, that group together and we met back in February. And that meeting in February was kind of to get an idea of really for us to scope out this issue and to really figure out what we needed to do, what were the important pieces. So we use what's called an interest-based approach. And what that was was we were trying to identify all of the different stakeholders involved in this issue and what their interests were, you know, what, what's in it for them, if you would. So we talked about our roles and responsibilities of all of those different stakeholder groups. We talked about um, responsibilities of each one of those groups, what their interests were. But we also talked about what, what are views of success because it's really surprising when you look at these different stakeholder groups, their vision of success can be very different from another one. So we tried to just take a really comprehensive look at this. We also talked about um, what does a comprehensive swimmer's edge control program look like? What are those different components of that? And then of course, um, common organs are control is like one piece of that. So then we delved in a little bit deeper into that and said, so what are the important parts of a common or control program and what does success look like that way. So that was kind of, like I said, really trying for us, uh, trying to get the information we needed to better understand the issue. I've got a, that quote there, swimmer's itch is a concern for many communities. There's an interest to develop a science-based, multifaceted and effective swimmer's itch program that addresses stakeholder interests. That was our problem statement. Actually, that's kind of how we started off that meeting, was talking about what is the problem statement so that we can try to address it. So this was agreed upon kind of across those different um, stakeholders that were um, involved in this group. So that was kind of, I, I think, like our, um, that was our guide. And that was certainly the guide for DNR as we started to look into, you know, what does the common management control program and policy look like. Then we brought the group, so then we kind of came back in DNR, we drafted up um, a very, I like to call it a drafty draft, a uh, policy of what this common organs or control program would look like. And we presented that to, again, this Five Lake core team, and then brought everybody back together in early July. And we were asking for some guidance and input into that policy development. So we, kind of had this straw dog of, a, of a, a, a policy, and we walked through that and really wanted to understand um, and get the, that kind of guidance from the experts, from you guys, and to what that policy should look like. So some of the things that we asked about, that we asked for the lake's help with in particular, was that allocation of take that you know Rob mentioned. Um, you know, how many are talking, how many does each lake need, um, eligibility that's been mentioned too, you know, what, when should lakes be allowed to participate in this program, um, how do you demonstrate that you have an issue with not just swimmer's itch, but that there's an association on your lake with common organzers. Um, contractors, what sort of standards should there be for contractors to be able to do this work? Um, capturing and handling procedures you know, help us understand, help us DNR, you know, understand what you're out, actually out there doing. Um, release site criteria, that was one, you know, Rob really emphasized, is what sort of sites should we be looking at to release all of these, and especially as we think about increased, potentially increased numbers of common or manager rooms being moved, where are we going to put all of these, and where does it make sense to put them? Um, different types of control. So we've emphasized a lot of the trapping and the relocation, but there is also um, finding nests and you know, nest and egg destruction, egg oiling. Is that a type of um, one of the control activities that lakes might be interested in? Um, what about the harassment? You know, lethal harassment, non-lethal harassment. So we talked a lot about those different um, aspects of what a, a control program would look like and what should be in this policy. And then um, the only other one I'll mention is also monitoring. So we want to we want to make sure this is successful. Certainly, you know the uh, DNR, you know our agency has an interest in making sure that um, you know this this program is actually accomplishing something that 
it is addressing the stakeholder needs, um, but it, that it is also, of course, um, protecting common or cancer populations. Um, so we talked a lot about monitoring and you know, what sorts of things should we be measuring, both at the agency level, but also as the different lakes are permitted to do this work, you know, what sort of monitoring requirements should there be? Um, so the great meeting in July. And so I just wanted to kind of walk through some pieces of, of this draft policy. So like I said, this is kind of that sneak peek of what you can expect to see in it. Um, one question we had is, you know, so who exactly are permits being issued to? So permits would be issued to landowners, land managers. They could be issued to lake associations. Um, the way that we're, we're thinking of doing this, at least the way we have it outlined now, is that those permits would be issued. And then on there, on like the permit application, there would be a block for the lakes or for the applicant to identify who their contractor is. Um, but the contractor would also have a separate permit from us. So there's basically, kind of think of it like a lake permit, but then also a contractor permit. And this is really, um, we also wanted to be uh, consistent with some of our other programs, and this is consistent with what we do for some of our other kind of um, wildlife conflict programs. Um, those separate contractor permits, so um, again, some of these work, what makes a contractor eligible to be able to do this work and get a, get a permit? Um, you know, having to demonstrate some sort of um, experience, um, some sort of knowledge in, a, in order to do this work. You know, we don't necessarily want to just issue contractor permits to people that don't know exactly what they're doing and could potentially be out there harming um, wildlife in the process. Um, so we had some discussion back in July about the length of time that permits were good for. So um, initially we were thinking they would be annual permits and we have decided that we want to make those longer than that. So we're not exactly sure that's one of the decisions that still has to be made if it's a three year permit or a five year permit. But the permit will be valid for multiple years. However, there will be annual reporting for all of the, the control activities. And that annual reporting the lake will have to report, but the contractor also. Now the lake can say, you know, as part of the, the contract, you know, say, you know, please do our annual reporting for us, and that's fine. But we do need to have that annual report for each permit. And that's partially because I actually should have mentioned this, um, and I don't have it in my slides here. The, the Michigan DNR, we have to get authority for this from the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. They're kind of the first level. So actually the way this is going to work in the way that we did it in 2017 was that the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service issued a permit to the Michigan DNR that allowed for common merganser control and it allowed for a certain number of common mergansers to be trapped and relocated. And then I think there was some other stuff in there about, like I said, some of the egg oiling. Um, so DNR, we have to get that permit first. So we're on the hook to the Fish and Wildlife Service in order to do all the annual reporting and everything. Well, um, so that's why we have to pass that on to the lakes themselves, and that we have these annual annual permit or excuse me annual reporting um, requirements is because we have to we the NR have to do that as well. Um, so what we have in there so far is you know we're covering the traffic and relocation, which is really the, the meat of the, of the policy. But we do have a section in there also for egg and nest destruction in natural cavities, and that is an emphasis there. We heard a little bit earlier today about you know putting up nest boxes and doing control activities out of that and using them for control activities. And we've decided not to include that, um, but to include a part of a section in there for um, nest and egg destruction in natural cavities. And then also including non-lethal harassment as part of this policy. And again, we, these are some the, these decisions came out of some really good discussions that occurred back in July. Um, some other pieces here. Um, so for participation in control activities, there's pieces of the policy that will address areas that are in single ownership, which probably isn't going to occur, occur very often. When it does, that's pretty easy if there's one landowner and the one landowner wants this type of activity to occur, that's great. 
However, most situations are going to be when there's multiple ownerships. So you think of most of the water bodies and there's more than one landowner. So again, to be consistent with our other programs that we have um, in the department, um, we require a couple of different things. Either a petition that's signed by at least 70% of the landowners, or it could be a resolution from the local municipality. So this could be the township, it could be the city, you know, whatever the case may be. Um, there was a lot of discussion about this back in July, that this could be a pretty onerous um, requirement. And this is one, again, to, ma to maintain that consistency with other programs. We're keeping this the way it is. However, one of the things we did allow for in this common merganser policy is that resolution can come from a county level. So if you can get your county board to pass a resolution, we'll accept that. Um, so that's kind of the difference here. Um, for eligibility criteria, we've, I think we've heard a little bit about this throughout the day, but the types of things we're looking at, right, is that, that, that you document in some sort of presence of swimmer's itch, um, either some information about the snail infection rates, it could be, you know, if you've got some qPCR information, and that could certainly become more important in the future. But some sort of documentation that you really, that your lake has an issue with swimmer's edge and you can show that association to common organizers. You know, we've heard, you know, let's, it wouldn't make sense for a lake to get a permit to trap and remove all the common organizers and then come to find out that wasn't the right parasite that you have there. So maybe you've spent a lot of money for, you know, no effect at all. So some eligibility criteria will be in there as well. Um, relocation site criteria, you know, I've already mentioned that. Rob, you did a good job of talking about the importance of that. Um, yeah, so right now, you know, we're looking at, for this kind of first blush, we're, we're looking at state land. Because again, you know, um, relocating these merganser groups on private lands, if that were to happen, we need to make sure that we have the permission of that landowner in order to let them go there. So we decided at least for this, you know, um, while we're new and kind of just starting out, we'll stick with state land. And, you know, looking again at, you know, the type of sand is stagnant all in there. Are there common organizers there? Is it good common organizer habitat? Is there, you know, public swimming beach or other type of recreation that has people in the water? So looking at a lot of those and MSIP and, you know, you guys are doing a great job of kind of taking the lead at trying to find some of those relocation sites. Monetary requirements that I mentioned already, and um, we're still kind of working that one out. If it's, you know, again, snail infection rates or if there's some qPCR that could be folded into, into that. Um, and of course, you know, if there's any kind of monitoring of actual swimmers that changes. And then fees established for permits. This is one that hasn't been decided on yet. We know we'll have some fees in there. One of the things that came up at the July meeting was we, we had fees that were consistent with our other programs. And the question was, would you need fees that high? for this program. Um, we like to have our administrative fees cover our work. And actually, um, you know, for this program, the administration of it on our end is probably much less than, for example, our Canada Goose program. So we're working on what those should be, um, probably much lower than they are for Canada for Canadians. So anyway, we're working on that part of it too. Um, I'm gonna kind of push through this, but we can come back to all of these different pieces of the policy got questions at the end. We just have a couple more slides. So timeline, um, we are behind a little bit from where we wanted to be. Um, we still don't have that draft policy out for comment. I still am hopeful that that will happen before the end of the month and we'll have that draft policy out and um, to get uh, public input on that. So we'll have that out for public uh, comment for at least 30 days. That's kind of a standard for us to allow at least 30 days for public comment. We'll get all those comments back, we'll go through them, and we'll try to have that final draft of a policy done by the end of November. Um, in November and December, so there's gonna be a number of regulatory type changes that'll be needed for this, just in our, our wildlife conservation orders um, that allow us to even be able to issue permits for um, common variants or control for contractors and things like that. So this is that idea of 
we're not in research anymore, we're kind of moving into the control realm and all of these kind of regulatory things that have to happen in order for us to be able to issue you guys permits. So those will be happening in November and December. That has to go through our Natural Resources Commission process. And again, there's, there's public comment periods built into that as well. And then the ultimate goal though, is that by January, um, you guys will, will have this brand new shiny um, common urban or policy and you will be able to start um, sending us applications and we'll be able to start issuing those permits. So that's the ultimate goal. Um, so my plan was when that draft policy is ready um, to be sent out, I'd like to send it to MSIP and have that kind of blasted out to the whole membership. Um, and we'll make sure we include instructions on there about how to provide comments, you know, where those need to be sent. Um, I did bring, though, I just kind of made up a really quick sign-up sheet. If you would like to receive that, that policy, that draft policy directly, instead of waiting for it to um, come through MSIP, just write down your name and your email, and I can keep these out on the table, um, just kind of sign up you know, during a, a break or before you leave. So if you'd like to receive that directly, just let me know and I can make sure to email that to you. And I think that's it. So like I said, I can kind of go backwards here to some of those policy, if you have any questions about those particular pieces. Rob? So I didn't see anything in your outline for training contractors and a trainer. Right, so we decided to keep that out of it. So one of our goals with this policy was to try to not make it too onerous, um, either for lakes applying for this, but also for contractors. And so um, we kept that out. So we're gonna have some kind of general um, kind of eligibility requirements or general standards for contractors. But as far as the training goes, we're gonna, Keep the policy out of that. Um, I really like the idea, and I know one of the things we talked about back in July was, you know, that could be a role for MSIP is to um, either train contractors or give some sort of like seal of approval for contractors, and that may make other lakes, you know, more comfortable hiring some folks. So, but we thought we would keep the training. Again, these are these policies, these department policies. And, high level as far as that goes and so they shouldn't have an awful lot of detail in them. Um, we want to make it flexible enough that we don't leave anybody out. Or <coughs> Bill Willard, Glen Lake Association. What went into, um, I guess we've always viewed it as a lake association where you have a group of people have a common goal. So I, I guess I was a little surprised to see home uh, landowner, land owners so I, I'm curious, does that carry over from the Canadian from? Yeah, that's, it is, it's a carryover. It's really mm -hmm. similar to our other policies. But the idea being, um, you know, even for some lakes, maybe they don't have a, a well-organized or a very active lake association. If ever a landowner or like a group of landowners that were just really concerned about, again, trying to make sure we can make this policy so that it would fit a lot of different folks. So it wouldn't have to be a lake association making that application. It could be a landowner, but that landowner would still have to go through either that petition process or that resolution process so that we would know if there was support for that activity across the lake. Okay. Any other questions? Yeah, Ron. So we were talking this morning about you know expanding this to other lakes and what we might find. And then thinking back to this past summer, we found a brood of hooded mergangers that hung out in Robinson Bay on North Lake Leland. But we were unable to trap those. Um, would there be any wiggle room to, um, over the years I've come across a couple of red-breasted broods um, on, on these lakes. Would there be some wiggle room to, to, to or is it going to be strictly limited to common mergangers? It's going to be strictly limited to common mergangers. And you know the way we've been successful, kind of moving this policy forward, is that's where the science has been. You know, so there's a good justification for having common answers. So that's why it's very specific to that because it does not apply. You know, that we don't have as much information about some of those other species. 
So if I got five or six landowners on Glen Lake that want to get a permit, are there multiple permits per lake then? No. Okay. No. And one you know, permit per lake. Right. And I'm trying to think of, you know, we haven't like drafted out what an actual application would look like, but it would have a, like a section in there for lake name or body of water. Okay. And so there would only be one permit for each one of those. Somewhat related to the last question, the curb with the on Salt Lake, we're not quite sure what the curb vector is. I suppose that it's unbiased, I think it's unbalanced. But what, what will you have to do in order to get balanced qualified for some type of permit? That's a good question, and I'm not really sure. You know, we were actually talking a little bit about this right before lunch at our table, and um, you know, to be quite honest, mallards are a different story. Um, you know, common mergansers, it, they're they're not one of the more desirable waterfowl species, one for hunters, but even for um, you know some some viewers. And but when you start talking about mallards. Um, want to start getting waterfowl hunters, for example, pretty riled up. Start talking to them about trapping mallards and moving them around. And all of a sudden, we have more stakeholders at the table. So we're going to have to, I think it's going to be a different process. I mean, a similar process, but with different people at the table. I was thinking more in line with uh, private farm mallards and getting food. Mm -hmm. So, right, so the, act, the control activities yeah. could look much different for different species, yeah. too. Yep. Is there any concern by um, the Michigan tourism industry in that you know people come up to Michigan? It's a it's a huge input to our economy. That this reputation, I know on Elk Lake and Torch Lake, we've got swimmers at that it's not such a great place to go vacation because you can't go swimming. I mean, it seems like the tourism industry should have a really vested interest in yeah. what's happening. All this contamination of the water where children can't swim in it anymore. So I, I, I can't speak too much to that because my department, you know, we don't get into tourism. Although I can say when we went through this process, certainly the, the tourism industry was one of those stakeholder interests that we considered. And, you know, we do have information from Higgins Lake. I know um, especially when we did their three-year pilot program, there was a lot of that information in there about impacts to not just tourism, but to local um, economies, so, yeah. But we also play, you know, there's, and again, this kind of relates to when other species are, are considered, um, you know, waterfowl hunting can be a really big economic driver in some of these locations around Michigan on some of these water bodies. So you just have more stakeholders at the table. I have back two questions. Yep. Um, the first is, uh, on a given lake, would you anticipate that you could give a permit to one contractor to do trap and relocation and another contractor on the same lake to do, say, horizon. So, um, I'm trying to think of, like, walk through the procedures here. And I believe we would leave it up to the applicant. And then that box that says, you know, who your contractor is, um, if two contractors were listed, we could issue two different permits. Are you concerned about conflicting activities, though? Yeah. Okay. Um, I, I'm not sure how to answer that right now. We've certainly learned a lot from Higgins Lake. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but it is difficult because we don't, you know, one of the things I think, like, as an agency, we don't want to get in the middle of right. is, you know, entrepreneurs and, you know, people trying to make a business and trying, you know, making people select one one company or another company. So we want to kind of leave that really open to the applicants. Um, but given the kind of situation that we had, you know, the past couple of years, we would take a pretty close look at that and maybe ask some questions of, if an application like that came in. But let, let's just say, for example, the two townships 
did somehow get together and they said, okay, as a compromise, we'll have contractor A do track of your location and contractor B do right. harassment. That's what sells the program. You would find that to be something. You would be an entity to townships getting together to specify to, to contract the person's so interest in the elements of the program. Potentially, although if it, if it could impact the effectiveness of what they were trying to do, I think that's what we could step in and, and at least ask some questions and ask for some clarification and some justification maybe for having the having two different people. I have three questions. When we talked in July, we talked about the interplay between harassment and traffic relocation. And I noticed you do allow permits for both. Um, have you come to any resolution or not come to a resolution or not really deciding whether there's a conflict necessarily between harassment and traffic relocation? I'd say we haven't come to a resolution yet. Um, and again, in writing the policy, the policy should be as broad as it can be to allow for as many activities as possible. Um, but we could put something in there about, um, you know, even under like the harassment section about, you know, as long as it doesn't conflict with other activities, or maybe that could fall under any of the control activities as long as those, you know, didn't conflict with any of these in a comprehensive type program. We've, we've heard again from Ron in particular that how the harassment affected again the traffic relocation. So we have a lot of evidence that harassment in close proximity, either shortly before or even years before, affected. Uh, and, you know, I can understand a late wanting to choose. Let's see, I can't afford or I don't want to do traffic relocation, so I'll choose harassment. But I guess we're kind of hoping you. Yeah. Look at that issue and, and come to some conclusion about whether those two work together. Can or not. exist together. I mean, we could. I still like the idea of leaving it in a policy to give that flexibility because maybe as a, as a multi-year um, permit, you know, maybe the harassment happens in a different year than the traffic and relocation. But um, yeah, I'll think about that some more, Jen, and we'll, we'll give it some more discussion. And then my last question, uh, this year we got a quota. Yes. An overall high level quota. Mm -hmm. uh, I didn't see anything in this related. So the, the goal is, um, because we, we took what you guys had to say in that July meeting especially about, you know, quotas don't really work and, you know, somebody's got to keep tabs on all of that. So what we, what we want to try to do is set is basically have no, you won't have a quota. In the permits that we issue you, there won't be a quota. It'll just be for the trapping and relocation. We're gonna try this. <laughs> and what we're gonna try to do is with our DNR permit that we get from the federal agency to try to request enough that we think it would cover it. And, you know, my thought is I'd like to try that for a couple of years, let's see where that comes in, especially as new lakes join the program, what kind of numbers are we looking at, and try to make those adjustments at that state and federal level instead of you know passing them on to you guys and kind of making you, um, it's a lot of administration on our end, quite frankly, too, to try to keep track of where you might be at, you know, at the beginning of June, at the middle of July, or are you reaching your quota? So I'd like to try to do that is not have quotas or any kind of numbers in your in the permits issued to the lakes to kind of see where that goes but again you know this it's this is brand new this is all brand new um, and it's a learning process so we want to make sure that you know we're adaptive and we're going to you know as we roll this out we're going to be um, evaluating it we're going to make changes as we need to along the way make adjustments um, that's, but we're starting kind of small. We're starting 
you know, a little bit conservatively because we really don't know what to expect. So one of the things, you know, we're asking for from, you know, all of you is to be a little patient, you know, because this could be bumpy, you know, for a couple of years, but we're gonna, you know, we're gonna try to get to um, where it's just kind of smooth and easy. But we really don't know what to expect. I mean, for the that activity across the lake. Okay. Any other questions? Yeah, so we were talking this morning about you know expanding this to other lakes and what we might find. And then thinking back to this past summer, we found a brood of hooded mergangers that hung out in Robinson Bay on North Lake Leelano, but we were unable to trap those. Um, would there be any wiggle room to? Um, over the years, I've come across a couple of red-breasted broods um, on, on these lakes. Would there be some wiggle room to, 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 or is it going to be strictly limited to common mergansers? It's going to be strictly limited to common mergansers. And, you know, the way we've been successful kind of moving this policy forward is that's where the science has been, you know, so there's a good justification for having common mergansers. So, that's why it's very specific to that because it does not apply. You know, we don't have as much information about some of those other species. So if I got five or six landowners on Glen Lake that want to get a permit, are there multiple permits per lake then? No. Okay. No. And one you know, permit per lake. Right, and I'm trying to think of, you know, we haven't like drafted out what an actual application would look like, but it would have a, like a section in there for lake name or body of water. And so there would only be one permit for each one of those. So related to the last question, the Kirkwood-Gander, it's Lake, we're not quite sure what the bird vector is. I suppose it's unbiased, I think it's unbalanced. But what will you have to do in order to get balance qualified for some type of permit? That's a good question, and I'm not really sure. You know, we were actually talking a little bit about this right before lunch at our table, and um, you know, to be quite honest, mallards are a different story. Um, you know, common mergansers, it, they're they're not one of the more desirable waterfowl species, one for hunters, but even for um, Know, some some viewers and but when you start talking about mallards um, you want to start getting waterfowl hunters for example pretty riled up start talking to them about trapping mallards and moving them around and all of a sudden we have more stakeholders at the table so we're gonna have to I think it's going to be a different process I mean a similar process but with different people at the table I was thinking more of with uh, so, right, so the, act, the control activities yeah. could look much different for different species yeah. too. Yep. 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 Is there any concern by um, the Michigan tourism industry in that you know people come up to Michigan and it's a, it's a huge input to our economy that this reputation, I know on Elk Lake and Torch Lake, we've got swimmers edge, that it's not such a great place to go vacation because you can't go swimming. I mean, it seems like the tourism industry should have a really vested interest in yeah. what's happening. All this contamination of the water where children can't swim in it anymore. So I, mean, I, I can't speak too much to that because my department, you know, we don't get into tourism. Although I can say when we went through this process, certainly the, the tourism industry was one of those stakeholder interests that we considered. And, you know, we do have information from Higgins Lake. I know, um, especially when we did their three-year pilot program, there was a lot of that information in there about impacts to not just tourism, but to local um, economies. So, yeah. But we also play, you know, there's, and again, this kind of relates to when other species are, are considered, um, you know, waterfowl hunting can be a really big economic driver in some of these locations around Michigan on some of these water bodies. So you just have more stakeholders at the table. I have two questions. Yep. Um, the first is, uh, on a given lake, would you anticipate that you could give a permit to one contractor to do trap and relocation and another contractor on the same lake to do, say, harassment? 
So, um, I'm trying to think of like walk through the procedures here, and I believe we would leave it up to the applicant. And in that box that says you know who your contractor is, um, if two contractors were listed, we could issue two different permits. Are you concerned about conflicting activities, though? Yeah. Okay. Um, I, I'm not sure how to answer that right now. We've certainly learned a lot from Higgins Lake. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but it is difficult because we don't, you know, one of the things I think, like, as an agency, we don't want to get in the middle of right. is, you know, entrepreneurs and you know people trying to make a business and trying you know making people select one one company or another company so we want to kind of leave that really open to the applicants um, but given the kind of situation that we had you know the past couple of years we would take a pretty close look at that and maybe ask some questions of if an application like that came in but let, let's just say for example the two townships did somehow get together and they said, okay, as a compromise, we'll have contractor A do track of your location and contractor B do right. harassment. That's what sells the program. You would find that because you would be an entity to townships getting together to specify to, to contract the person to get to elements of the program. Potentially, although it's it. If it could impact the effectiveness of what they were trying to do, I think that's when we could step in and, and at least ask some questions and ask for some clarification and some justification maybe for having the having two different people. I have three questions. When we talked in July, we talked about the interplay between harassment and traffic location. And I noticed do allow permits for both. Um, have you come to any resolution or not come to a resolution or not really deciding whether there's a conflict necessarily between harassment and traffic relocation? I'd say we haven't come to a resolution yet. Um, and again, in writing a policy, the policy should be as broad as it can be to allow for as many activities as possible. Um, but we could put something in there about, um, you know, even under like the harassment section about, you know, as long as it doesn't conflict with other activities, or maybe that could fall under any of the control activities as long as those, you know, didn't conflict with any of these in a comprehensive type program. We've, we've heard again from Ron in particular that how the harassment affected again the traffic relocation. So we have a lot of evidence that harassment in close proximity, either shortly before or even years before, can affect it. Uh, and, you know, I can understand a late wanting to choose, let's see, I can't afford or I don't want to do traffic relocation, so I'll choose harassment. But I guess we're kind of hoping you. Yeah. Look at that issue and, and come to some conclusion about whether those two work together. Can exist together. I mean, we could. I still like the idea of leaving it in a policy to give that flexibility because maybe as a, as a multi-year um, permit, you know, maybe the harassment happens in a different year than the traffic and relocation. But um, yeah, I'll think about that some more, Jen, and we'll, we'll give it some more discussion. And then my last question, uh, this year we had a quota. Yes. An overall high level quota. Mm -hmm. uh, I didn't see anything in this related. So the, the goal is, um, because we, we took what you guys had to say that July meeting especially about, you know, quotas don't really work and, you know, somebody's got to keep tabs on all of that. So what we, what we want to try to do is set is basically have no, you won't have a quota. In the permits that we issue you, there won't be a quota. 
it'll just be for the trapping and <laughs> we're gonna try this. <laughs> and what we're gonna try to do is with our DNR permit that we get from the federal agency to try to request enough that we think it would cover it. And you know, my thought is I'd like to try that for a couple of years. Let's see where that comes in, especially as new lakes join the program. What kind of numbers are we looking at? And try to make those adjustments at that state federal level instead of you know passing them on to you guys and kind of making you. Um, it's a lot of administration on our end, quite frankly, too, to try to keep track of where you might be at. You know, at the beginning of June, at the middle of July, or are you reaching your quota? So I'd like to try to do that. Is not have quotas or any kind of numbers in your in the permits issued to the lakes to kind of see where that goes. But again, you know, this it's this is brand new. This is all brand new. Um, and it's a learning process and so we want to make sure that you know we're adaptive and we're going to you know as we roll this out we're going to be um, evaluating it we're going to make changes as we need to along the way make adjustments um, that but we're starting kind of small we're starting you know a little bit conservatively because we really don't know what to expect so one of the things you know we're asking for from you know all of you is to be a little patient you know because this could be bumpy you know for a couple of years but we're gonna you know we're gonna try to get to um, where it's just kind of smooth and easy but we really don't know what to expect I mean for the this past year we had five lakes to deal with and you know we had some bumps, you know, especially with um, having individual quotas for every lake. But, you know, I thought it worked pretty well. But the unknown is how many lakes might be coming on board next year, 2019, 2020. You know, what kind of numbers are we going to talk about? So that's where I think adjustments might have to be made in the future. And that's where, the, like, the partnership with MSIP and all the lake associations is really, really, you know, honestly super important because we need your feedback on this. We need to know how things are going. Um, so, like I said, I guess just be patient with us. But that's that's the goal for the next couple of years is you won't have quotas to worry about. That'll be something we worry about. But if the Fish and Wildlife Service gives us what we ask for is another question. All right, I don't know where to go here. <laughs> well, in regard to your timeline, of assuming you can more or less keep this in January mm -hmm. would be the day we could start to apply. Um, do you have any sense of how soon we might expect an, an answer? Because that all depends on our summer planning as well. An answer for which piece? For whether our permit has been issued or not. Oh, that should, um, I would say by, well, because I know we're kind of behind the eight ball. We said January, but um, typically by March, I would say it's usually about a 60-day time frame to get all those permits issued, um, processed and issued. But I don't think there's going to be that many of them that I'm hoping we can get those back to you in February. Sure. Because there's sure. a lot of planning. will be kind of a new process, too. Yeah, and there's going to be a lot of planning on your end, too, you know, as far as um, if you need to get petitions or you know, things like that. So we're trying to give you as much time as possible. Back to uh, the issue of trap, uh, I mean, uh, trap and relocate as opposed to harassment. If you have one one permit for body of water and one only one permit holder, then that permit holder would probably be able to manage those two types of abatement. Uh, and I think it would be best to keep that management right at that level. I think the problem might be, though, if you have multiple groups seeking the permits, and one year you have a a harassment group get the permit and then the next year uh, uh, did so there there is and i'm from the green and duck lake association and uh, we currently aren't uh, participating but i would think in the future we may want to so we would want this big enough lake and diverse enough that i could see that happening <coughs> uh, that's an area that would need some consideration it's another benefit of multi-year permits too, um, so that you wouldn't have the competing, you know, perhaps competing uh, 
uh, permit applications annually. That the hope is that you know on a lakewide basis there's a plan. Um, that's actually one of the criteria we have in here too is that the lakes that apply should have a comprehensive swimmers edge control plan what that they share with us. So the permit will. There's been some discussions with the Michigan Economic Development. Um, <coughs> You know, I, I would like to encourage you to consider with the harassment piece to sort of apply the same thinking that you did with the, you know, the different types of organic you that you've got to go with the research because I think, you know, we've done spring harassment for years and years and we never, there was never any science behind it. So maybe you'd want to think about even attaching some sort of, um, would that permit that, you know, so, so that we can find out, you know, uh, because otherwise we just, Keep doing these activities, you know, we thought for a long time spring harassment, but we found in the last couple of years we're doing some, some research that, you know, really didn't, on, on at least a few lakes, didn't appear to do much uh, in either thing that we were trying to do. And then the same might be true for fall, um, so it would just involve, you know, maybe tying that to the permit that, hey, if you want to show somehow that this is doing something. Otherwise, you know, it's just fall harassment. Idea. Well, how do you know it's right. Would a single landowner be held to the same eligibility requirements at, at, for this application process as a lake association? In other words, they, would they also have to have research that showed that they have the need? Yes. Okay. Yep. Yep. We treat all all sites, all lakes the same, regardless of ownership, <coughs> as far as that goes. back to the uh, non-covered species. Mm -hmm. I'm asking this because we have to ask with Lake Leo. South Lake Leo, uh, I think it would be instructive to tell applicants what they would have to do, what they have to look at to be considered for a permit for whatever it is, so that the or balance. Otherwise, you know, we, don't, we sort of know what to do.
south of lakes in Michigan. And the chances of, if we look closer at each lake, to find out how many families are reproducing that rapidly, it would so seem like it might be a concern in the future. So it, it could be. You know, we do have some information to look at. We have um, a breeding bird survey that's done. Again, that type of information doesn't indicate that there's been a great increase in common bird banter. They are typically more found in the northern lower and the upper peninsula, not as much in the southern lower. Um, so we do have some, some, certainly some monitoring information yeah, that you can look at and keep an eye out on that. Barbara, let's just take a hypothetical. Glen Lake Association files for a permit under the new policy, asks for a three-year permit, if that's what's permitted, to both trap and relocate in the springtime and then to harass in the fall for purposes of migrant birds and they, they tend to flock in areas and create hot spots and then basically also your constituents if, if birds are accumulating in their front yard on their water they want you to do something about it so i think for for local politics and fundraising purposes anyway i'm, I'm going on to tell a story but i guess our, our thought would be three-year permit that might include in the same filing trap and relocate the spring <coughs> harassment of migratory birds in the fall. Is that something along the lines that we have in mind? Uh, yeah, I think so. So I, I will point out though um, the kind of what what fall, like a definition of fall. Once legal hunting, legal waterfowl hunting begins, then there would be harassment. There would be no harassment allowed. That harassment would be kind of outside of legal hunting. So that's just something to keep in mind. So, for example, this year um, up here, uh, the duck season starts October 7th. Um, so that if there were fall harassment, it would only go up until that that point in time. Just kind of a clarification. Because at that point, we hope then to try to utilize that recreational resource. So I just want to, one other thing that came to mind, um, this is something I've been working with Rob on, is they've been pursuing um, that county level resolution. So along with the policy, we intend to have um, templates for these resolutions, templates for petitions, templates for resolutions. But if it's something that you anticipate, um, that if this policy comes out in January, and you get your application in in February, let's say, and, and you don't think that's going to be enough time, let's say, to get a resolution or something like that, give me a call, um, shoot me an email, and, you know, we, I think we can work through that. So, like, what Rob's been doing is kind of running um, examples and, you know, back and forth trying to develop that template. So we can share that with you if that's something you think you want to get started on before um, this all goes online so that it's in place. I just wanted to mention that if, if time is of the essence for any of your lakes, then just let me know that, okay? And we'll, we'll just, I guess it's going to be bumpy, but we'll try to do as much as we can for you guys, especially in these first couple of years. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.